It's the beat generation. It's Bayat. It's the beat to keep. It's the beat of the heart. It's being beat and down in the world and like old time low down. And like in ancient civilizations, the slave boatmen rowing galleys to a beat. Well, man, well, I belong to the beat generation. They called themselves the beat generation. It was in the mid 1940s. Worn down by the conservative ways of post war America, a group of writers, Allen Ginsberg, William S. Burroughs, and Jack Kerouac began putting their thoughts of nonconformity to paper. Fueled by the spontaneous creativity of jazz and bebop, rejecting the materialistic values of suburbia, politics, and conventional lifestyle, the Beat Generation represented the counterculture. They were writers, poets, and artists who wanted to live freely, expand their creativity without censorship, and experiment with non-conventional ways of achieving creative enlightenment. The word beat was coined by Jack Kerouac to describe this movement, perhaps because of its definition on the street, broke, homeless, exhausted. Jack Kerouac's novel, On the Road, put the beat generation on the map, turning an idea by a group of writers into a trendy, mainstream catchphrase. The beat generation became profitable. On the Road is loosely based on seven years of Kerouac's road trips with fellow beat writers. While living in Manhattan, he composed the book on teletype paper, which he called The Roll, within three weeks. Although it was written in 1951, On the Road wasn't published until 1957. By then, Jack Kerouac was off the road, living in Orlando, Florida. Author and television personality Bob Keeling developed a fascination with Kerouac's connection to Central Florida. He wrote the book, Kerouac, Where the Road Ends, after researching his life and literary career during his time in College Park, a small neighborhood near downtown Orlando. I did some research, and all I could ever find was that he died in St. Petersburg, but the, all of the major biographers seemed to just skip over this period in his life, so I thought it would be fun to see what I could find out about it. And so it took weeks of searching, and finally, I called up the executor of Kerouac's estate, who's listed in the Lowell, Massachusetts phone book. And in this great Bostonian accent, he says, yeah, Jack wrote down every place he ever lived. Let me see here, 57, 1418 Cloyser Street. He lived in Orlando from uh, the end of 1956 uh, until 1962. Now, it wasn't all of that time, but significant portions of that time. And while he was here uh, in the Clouser house, his entire career was transformed. He'd been the nomad, nobody rider from Lowell, Massachusetts. He'd published one book years ago, but it really didn't do anything. He was living here at the time On the Road came out and made him this national uh, sensation and sort of a reluctant spokesman for the Beat Generation. Then he wrote the follow-up here called The Dharma Bums, which is a, a wonderful book. Uh, and then he came back uh, to live in Kingswood Manor off of Lee Road uh, for a significant portion of 1961 and all of 1962. And in that home, he wrote his book, Big Sur, in 1961. This quiet little suburb would become Jack's retreat from the frenzy surrounding his book, On the Road. He didn't like to associate himself with the fame and media attention. Instead, he preferred to focus on the pursuit of spiritual enlightenment a search for truth and meaning. Jack Kerouac, King of the Beats, also loved the quiet life in Orlando, and he used this time to reflect and to write. He was a man of contradictions. Here he is being credited with being the forerunner of the counterculture and the hippie movement, and yet he was a conservative Catholic Republican. While people are discovering his book on the road and, and taking themselves and, and their stories on the road, discovering themselves, uh, you, breaking out of the, the conformist uh, nuclear family type existence, he's living with his mom in the suburbs of, of Florida. So you see again and again, there's sort of the public persona of Kerouac, but the private persona is much different, but that's what makes the story rich and interesting. In a warm Florida fall of 1957, Kerouac began writing The Dharma Bums. He typed on a royal standard typewriter in a small one-room apartment. Like its predecessor on the road, Kerouac was obsessed with completing the book, which he did in 12 days. He would sleep outside in a sleeping bag, eat fresh tangerines by day, 
and overdose in benzedrine and alcohol to ignite his imagination. Neighbors could hear his fingers typing away into the middle of the night. The Dharma Bums is the sequel to On the Road. It tells the story of two friends on a search for the meaning of life through travels and the study of Buddhism. Kerouac had developed an appreciation for this ancient Zen philosophy in 1953, when he began reading about Buddhism and studying Buddhist literature. Like the philosophy that inspired him, the Dharma Bums echoes a common theme in his life, a continuous search for truth and the suppression of suffering. I think that's why I liked his book, The Dharma Bums, so much, because he talks about hiking in the high cascades and, and hiking in the mountains out west and finding a serenity out there and finding an existence beyond the alcohol. While writing the Dharma Bums, a local Time magazine photographer captured the simple lifestyle of this complex writer at work. It's just such a thrill that these photos are going to be staying in Orlando and Orange County because they document one of the most crucial points of, of Kerouac's uh, life and his career. It was his last prolific period as a writer and it was right here in the Kerouac house which is now on the, the city of Orlando's historic register. So those pictures are absolutely invaluable and they're classic because they show him actually engaged in the writing process in this little 10 by 10 room that you could only get to through the bathroom and at the same time he's on the New York Times bestseller list. He's the toast of the national literary scene but he's living hand to mouth in this back porch apartment. I think, I think that's very moving. What these pictures could not reveal was the physical toll years of alcohol and drug abuse had on his body. Not only did Kerouac drink to write, but he used drugs and alcohol to live up to the media's reputation of Kerouac as the leading voice of the Beats. A pop culture icon who never desired the spotlight, but wanted respect from the literary community. Part of the difficulty of dealing with fame and the critics forced him further and further down this terribly self-destructive path uh, of alcoholism. And indeed, he died of, a, of, of, a, of an internal hemorrhage in St. Petersburg in 1969. He died a, a terrible, miserable death. But I'm glad in the sense that with things like the Kerouac Project, his legacy lives on. This road definitely goes on here in Florida. Thank you.